Welcome to Rattling the Stars. My name is Tammy Tucky, and welcome to my YouTube channel and this special podcast interview series. Back in the 80s, one of horror's most well-known monsters, the Phantom of the Opera, had seemed to take center stage once again due to Andrew Lloyd Webber's hit musical, Taking Broadway by Storm. So while a planned film version of this musical fell through, audiences were graced with a different Phantom story that deviated from most of its source material. And yet combined both elegance and horror to make a bloody delightful film. So, of course, I'm referring to the 1989 horror classic, The Phantom of the Opera. And I have two wonderful castmates from that film who are here on the show today, and they're going to introduce themselves to you. Hi, I'm Jill Scholin, and I played Christine. Hi, this is Alex Hyde-White, and I played Richard, the Raoul character. Oh my gosh, I'm just really, really excited to have you guys on the show. I'm not usually a horror person, and I was telling Jill we were messaging on Facebook, which is kind of how this conversation turned out to be, and I'm so glad you're a part of it, Alex. But yeah, we we you. were just messaging, and I, was, I had just found this film by chance, because I was researching The Phantom of the Opera for a project, and I was like, what is this? So... I watched it and I was like, okay, this is extremely different from anything I've ever seen Phantom. Because everybody usually does the same thing. One, two, three, four. It's like it follows the same plot line. But your film does not at all. So when you guys first read the script, what were your what were your thoughts about it? I'll go here. I, I was kind of disappointed because I thought I had a pretty good singing voice at the time. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, I don't know. Joe, what did you think? You were you were you were you were the star at the time. What did you think? Well, I did. It it wasn't uh, you know, Phantom of the Opera. What was so popular of the day? I mean, it was quite different for me. I just thought it was fun to be a part of a Phantom of the Opera. I I think the script, um, you know, it had different qualities to it. I suppose it wasn't the highest level of a script you could get your hands on. But sometimes, you know, these things are just fun to be a part of. I mean, it's it's a, you yeah. know, we're forever attached to a Phantom no, of the no. Opera. <laughs> no, you're right. The magic, like you say in your intro, Tammy, the magic of the title was it was it was really, it was top class. You know, at the time, it was. Uh, I remember I had family friends who knew Michael Crawford, and so I ended up actually seeing the show in New York. I think probably '88, which is, it was at its height, and it was so magical and transcendent. Yes. That, no, was. seriously. You say, and you know, you so you start you get into the shower and you say, "Well, actually, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe, maybe I can do this stuff." And you and you forget that it takes years of training to be able to yeah. play a character like that. And so this was our chance to inhabit that same space. And you know, the, these parts probably weren't easy to get either. So you know, yeah, we were. We're not. We're always at the mercy of the material. But in this case, the the sort of the magic of the title made up for what ended up maybe being you know, shortcomings in the script. Did I would agree with that. I mean, just to be a part of it. I mean, I, I, you know, sometimes periodically, I don't do very many of those shows where you go out and sign and everything. But one of my favorite things that I love when fans bring me something are these books on Phantom of the Opera. And they have these incredible collections of, you know, all these signatures of people over the decades being sure. in the portions yeah. of Phantom. Yeah. He seems to be a character so many people identify with. And so when they took it to a darker side for this film, which I was quite surprised because everybody romanticizes it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it was a little bit different in that aspect where it was kind of sexual, but it was, it pulled away from that very quickly. So yeah. <laughs> I was kind of surprised how it all turned out. You had such an all-star cast. I would say something, you know, it was okay, okay. wonderful character actors that you had. So did you guys do a script reading or were you really thrown into Budapest I, and doing did. the film? No, I don't think we did. Um, no. It's probably, probably a good thing because all most of those English actors were raging alcoholics anyway, and so I think at a script reading, the director might have been freaked out. But once, <laughs> once they arrived on set, I mean, they're bloody brilliant. I mean, a lot of them sobered up now, probably, but uh, but but uh, when they, you know, they were brilliant, and those sets were wonderful. I mean, the story oh. goes that Menachem had produced and uh, the Three Penny Opera with Roger Daltrey. And they had those sets at Ma Film, which was the same sort of 
time period, I guess you'd call it Ed Edwardian England, um, late 1800s, early 1900s. And he says, what can we do? And they figured out, wait a minute, Phantom of the Opera. Nobody owns that. It's, it's, uh, it's public domain. And so Menachem made his own horror movie version. He was a clever guy. But on the other hand, I think, you know, as Alex, I'm sure you've discussed so many times regarding the film, that was also the, the kind of the demise of the film, because I think they tried to bridge two worlds and they probably would have been better off sticking to one. I mean, it was so, so beautiful for yeah. a yeah. horror movie done in Freddie Vane. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. In fact, if, he, if they if they sort of bet on on uh, Robert sort of going playing being against type, actually being uh, a, 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 a romantic hero with a tragic flaw, as opposed to a horror movie dressed up as the Phantom, it might have it might have um, given him a chance. But you know, these it was a business and. Menachem was uh, was pretty ruthless when it came to business, and I think he was quite happy to make a horror film and sort of borrow the majesty of Phantom of the Opera as much as as much as he could, hoping they'd get away with it. And I, it's probably ended up mixed results. But you know, look, these things are hard to make, and they were. Uh, it seemed easy thirty years ago. I mean, oh, you're making a film. And nowadays, the way people make films, it's so much more, it's so much easier and so much less prepared. And, and the production value, you're lucky to get anything. And so you look back and, you, and if, if all we have to say about this film is, you know, it wasn't really a real horror movie and it wasn't really a romantic uh, a drama like Phantom should be. You, you throw that out the window, you look at it for what it is. And it's a, you know, it's a bloody good film that takes weeks to make with excellent craftsmen. And films like these... You know, there's not a lot of them, especially on a, when they're made independently. Well, Alex, mm -hmm. you said so many lovely things in there. I just think there's nothing for me to say because you said it. it's going back when you first started talking about it. I loved your use of language when you talked about borrowing that majestic feel of Phantom of the Opera. I mean, because it really was beautiful. The costuming, the sets, the lighting, it was so romantic. And it didn't seem to fit. You know, you wouldn't normally find those elements in a nightmare or a Halloween movie. Or <laughs> no. yeah. It was yeah. a European, you're right, it was a European <laughs> film. I still remember the Hungarian Elemer, the Hungarian cameraman yeah. and, the, and the crew. I mean, yeah, these guys were, and, and the makeup and hair people it was it was a big it felt like a studio film in the 1950s maybe you know and we were and we were we were treated so beautifully mm -hmm. and it was a great experience and then you go to see the movie and go oh my god yuck and then whoa well okay i don't die too many but i'm proud of that death scene that's for sure <laughs> i gotta say like i just showed this we we go on a ski trip up with some friends every year it's an annual thing and i bring random unusual films that they have never seen so this was our first night we actually did facials <laughs> before oh. we <laughs> watched the movie i sent yeah. jill the photo i'll send it to you alex but oh, we were having fun but i remember the first reaction when we started out in new york they were all really confused they're like wait we're yeah. in new york and then yeah. we get to the to, to the back into the you know nineteenth century of the the beautiful Victorian you know opera house and I think a lot of them were very shocked that that switch came and I thought that was I thought it was so different because that was what struck me within the first ten minutes because usually I'm not if I'm I'm not grabbed by the first ten minutes I'm not interested and that's what really hit me because I was like I love the costumes and the <laughs> sets that you guys got to enjoy and and Alex you'll, you'll You'll be happy to know that um, I, I, this is a spoiler alert. So if anybody has not seen the film, please go and see it. <laughs> Forget how it ends. Yeah. Whoops. Um, but I will say when your character was stabbed, everybody was very upset. They were like, yeah. what? You're kidding me, right? Yeah. I said I was the same way. <laughs> but don't they light me on fire? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, All of that fire stuff. Yeah. I, I remember that being tough. I was like, ah. That must have that been scary. Tough. I remember they had trouble with the wig for the stuntman. And I think somebody said, Alex, can you just come in here for a minute? I go, no, I'll be in the trailer with Bill. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my god! Yeah, it was disappointing for me too that he died. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get to make up for it now. Well, you can say you're the first Raul, technically, who has ever died in a Phantom of the Opera story. That's right. So, That's so what funny. was what was Budapest like to film at? Because I, I from the behind the scenes feature, I I kind of gandered that there was a lot of um, political turmoil at the time. Oh, that's right. They did a behind-the-scenes a couple of years ago for it, didn't they? That's right. Yep. Uh, yeah, it was really Jill, cool. I had some fun. I remember we there was some. Lovely sort of, you know, the great thing that the sort of the the un, sort of the undiscovered thing about a lot of these Eastern Bloc countries was the old English spies would know, but they had some of the finest restaurants in the world. They and did. I, uh, Jill and I had some fun. There was this, we had, she and I went to dinner one night at so this crystal sort of palace of a restaurant. I can't remember the name of it but it was it would be like on the time it was like the dining room of the titanic or something it was absolutely yes I, I will never forget ever 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 it was stunning and the way yeah. the people were dressed they were dressed yeah they dress just like in the titanic they were fully dressed yeah to go to dinner <laughs> it's like it was it was like stepping back into another time it and was. was real life was it um, was it the spring of of eighty nine? Sort of, it was this time of year, really, sort of February to April or something of eighty nine. Was it? I think it was a little bit sooner, but I could be wrong. Uh, yeah, you know, maybe I thought, well, I thought I like January, Feb. No, yeah. maybe February, March. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I think that we would drive out to Ma Film, the studio, about twenty minutes from Budapest, and I remember the seasons would change. It would snow on the ground to poppies blooming mm -hmm. by the end. So. It was ended up being six months, Sammy, before the 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 wall fell, basically. Yes. And um, I remember the taxi drivers, and because it was the western edge of the Eastern Bloc, it was it's where the old Roman Empire ended, was the Danube River, and um, so it had probably changed hands many times. And I remember the taxi drivers and people at the hotel; they knew that the end was coming, and there was already a healthy commerce with the, yes, uh, there was. With, with the West. And um, so it was, a, you know, it was a bit of history um, being in a place like it. But it didn't it didn't feel penal and it, or it didn't feel like we were being spied on. I had never had that kind of experience, you know, call me spoiled brat, you know, being raised in the San Fernando Valley. My world was a little bit small. And um, until I started making movies. Yeah. And I just remember I was vegetarian mm -hmm. And so that was an interesting experience going into a country like that for me, where they didn't have a lot of fresh foods. And right. I remember here we were in this, you know, they called it a five star hotel and, and like, I don't know, ordering something very common, like butter for your toast on a Tuesday and then apologizing that they won't have it until Saturday. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember yeah. stuff like that at the restaurant? How many things on the menu were not available? Do you remember that at yeah. all? Yeah. Well, I, I I remember I remember you and I having dinner and probably a couple other things, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't remember being put out too much. Oh well, I think it was because of my you know not eating meat, yeah, chicken yeah, or any of that stuff. I I yeah. remember having a tougher time, and I don't think Dwight Little liked it so much for me in front of the camera when. You know, five, six weeks later, I was 10 pounds heavier. Oh. Having bread, cheese, oh. champagne, caviar, oh. yeah. um, and vodka as my staple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we used to go for long runs on the river, and it was it was a great place to spend. Well, we got you. We were there like 10 weeks or something, I think, quite a while. Uh, yeah, we were. I can say I loved that experience there. I miss that country. I thought the people were extraordinary, and yeah. it's one of my all-time favorite locations. Gosh, was, yeah. Well, Jill, had, you started when you were a kid, like, what, 15 years old or something, or what? No, I think a lot of people think that because of the how young of the parts that I played. Right, okay. Yeah. I mean, I started at 15, 16 in commercials. and Right. Well, that's a start. Yeah, out of L.A., and I did all those big singing, dancing commercials, or a lot of them, and... And, um, but I, you know, the theatricals started happening probably 19, 
uh, 19 years old, 20, 21. Yeah. In that range. And I had my little run until I had my first child. And then the day I found out I was pregnant, I literally walked from the business. I called my agents. And yeah. Said, I'm done. I and when was that? <laughs> when, when was that? That was, I got pregnant. Um, in 1994 is when yeah. I got pregnant. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. um, yeah. and left the business. Well, we miss you in the business, Jill. Oh, you need to come well, back. So <laughs> sweet. <laughs> that would be, that would be really great to see you and Alex and Robert kind of reunite. I don't know, do something interesting yeah. in Budapest. <laughs> yes. What? What could that be now? It would have to be a reality show of some sort. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's a shame because some of the actors have passed away. Um, Stephanie Lawrence, who was uh, La Carlotta. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. Terrence Harvey, Inspector Hawkins. Yeah, he was great. He, he, I did not know that. Yeah. He, he and even there was a young gal who died quite young. Emma Rawson, I think, was her name. She must have played. She, she died? died. Yeah, she was a young, nice English gal. She died? I didn't even know. Yeah. I couldn't even find no, anything I on I her. Remember, I so There was another Terrence. I think there was a Terrence Beasley in the film that I met at some BAFTA event ages ago, 15 years ago or 10 years ago in L.A., and he told, told me that. Um, oh. Yeah, you know, that's really... And he passed away, too. And then very really? recently. Yeah, oh very recently. Yeah. What was it like working with each of them? Well, I mean, you know, I think, you know, collectively, they're just, they're just, it's like, you know, I, I don't know. I just, it's, it's probably like being deployed with a crack unit. You know, there's bullets flying, but somehow you just feel that you're, that you're protective. <laughs> even if you're, even if you're ducking your heads in the sand, those things, those English boys will take care of it. You know, I mean, they're just. <laughs> <laughs> they're really, they're really terrific. And every once in a while, they throw me inside the coach with Bill Nye, and you know, he and I would be, oh yes, of course, no, couldn't possibly, yes, of course, couldn't possibly. And there's your scene, and you know, yeah. it just uh, things like that. They see seem easy. Look, the hard, the hard part, Tammy, is it getting the work. And in order to get the work, there's you know many steps that have to go into it you have to be well represented you have to you have to uh leave your ego at the door when you're going through the review or the audition process but at the same time you have to fill your costume with um with an approximation of what you can do in the role and then once you walk in the room you know if there's six or seven people you say to yourself oh my god six or seven people couldn't decide what kind of sandwich to have for lunch let alone cast this part (laughs) <laughs> but in, in when it's independent film, and even to this day, if it's the director and the producer and the casting director, and they're looking to cast and looking to hire, you walk into that room, and if the preceding steps have been made, then it's not really up to you anymore. You just do what you're there to do, and they're the ones who, in their own mind, validate it. And they're really, they're not validating you. They're validating themselves because they're making the choice. Yeah. You that's know? Well said. Once once everybody shuts up, and that's the great thing about, you know, being a film actor, at least when it was real film, the only time you speak is when everyone else is quiet. And the, the inherent power in those moments, uh, it, it, it's beautiful. It's transcendent. And then when you're when you're surrounded by a, a cast and crew of which you're a part of that, just make it seem easy. And they're doing it for the right reasons, um, uh, because, you know, it's it's better than working. The work is getting the opportunities. And so, you know, you kind of feel it's kind of like maybe like we would feel uh, at the at this nice restaurant that we went to. I hope I'm sure Jill had something nice to eat that night. But it would just, I did. It, you know, <laughs> yeah, it seems effortless. It seems easy. Uh, but it takes a lot of it takes a lot of work to polish those chandeliers and to light the candles, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, I've always thought about that, too, over the years back when I was working it uh, all the time. And getting movies and, you know, you're side by side and we'll leave names out of it. But suffice to say, you're side by side at an audition for a, If I'll take a couple of movies that I did, a Phantom or a Popcorn or a, I don't know, Rich Girl, whatever. But the point is you're there and you're side by side with somebody who's aching and dying to get that role to get to the next step, but you get it. And then you're not available 
for the next thing and they get it some huge picture and go on to become (laughs) so the, the work you do it's like as an actor and all those years of going out and meeting people you go out there and i think you said it really beautifully alex about your work is going out and and getting those jobs it's you have and you do have to leave your ego at the door. I wish I didn't, not my ego, but I, I, I look back at the time of working and Phantom would be one of the pictures and I'm gonna put this um, for me as a woman into this category. And that is that I, uh, you know, was not happy with the, the way the female role was written. There were some things that could have been so easily cleaned up, like a nothing to clean them up. It's yeah. to not make her uh, so, you know, dim-witted, you know, I, I don't want to say this word, dim-witted female, but that caricature of that at that time and before, the, definitely how things have changed now. And I didn't speak up. You know, I never spoke up. Well, I no. just allow, you know, it's just like my job is to show up and say the lines they tell me to say. And I, I wish I had more, I don't know if it's confidence or whatever at that time, to speak up, up about what was actually going on in my brain. <laughs> yeah, well, you probably wouldn't have had much support. I mean, I'm, uh, Dwight probably would have, yeah. would have supported you. But yeah, no, you're right. I mean, and. I've been in plenty of films at that time where it's easy to see that it was a man's world out there. And, um, uh, you know, I could understand where that that could have made you feel thwarted. It seemed like they were it seemed like it was like a rush production because you had to use that set within a time frame. Right. So that's why it was like, OK, we have to do this now. Now you're in. Yeah, the pre, you're right. The pre-production was probably a bit rushed. Yes. It was two sound stages. It's a wonderful facility. I think it's still there. Ma Film, it's called. Didn't you have friends come and visit you during from L.A. or from? Didn't you have people come out? Brad Pitt was the only one. Brad Pitt. Yeah. Well, that'll do. <laughs> Wait. Why yeah. was Brad Pitt there? Yeah, Wait. What? Well, he heard. He heard Alex Hyde White was in the swimming pool, so I think he would. He came down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Brad, Brad knew, Brad knew what was worth traveling. He obviously came for the fruit and vegetables. <laughs> oh my God. I think he's the only one that came out and visited me. Oh no, yeah. you know who you're thinking of? I had an assistant at the time. Oh, and she good. came out for the first couple of weeks with me. Tenet. Oh, right, good. She yeah. was with me for the first two or three weeks. Right, right. It was probably two years before. Um, Thelma and Louise, but he no, got, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, he got Thelma and Louise on the on pretty much on the heels around Phantom at the Opera, right okay. as we were finishing. Good. Oh wow! Well, that that yeah. trip to Budapest put him in a good place then. <laughs> <laughs> he felt the light. It yeah. shined upon him. <laughs> yeah, you had a good chat with him about underrepresented female characters, and so he made sure that Thelma and Louise, before they drove the car off the cliff, that they kicked some ass. There That's we go. That's right. That's yeah. right. I yeah. like that narrative. So Jill Shalen changed the uh, the directory of female empowerment in, in her ninety eight eighty nine off screen conversation with young actor Brad Pitt in Budapest while playing a character who she felt should be more powerful, but ends up shooting the Phantom with a gun. So. Oh There's your story by Alex Hyde White. Thank you for having me. I'm available. <laughs> yeah, I mean, boy, oh boy, what a story! <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> You're just killing me. Well, it sounds like we're the only three left. You, me, and Robert. So, <laughs> you know, and no, Bill. Bill Nye's still around, of course. Yeah. You are funny. Yeah. Well, I've had a lot of, lot of, a lot of practice. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do, I think, you know, when it says a so-and-so film, they live or die by that. Yeah. And, you know, and they, do, they, they can really, to some degree, or a lot of degrees, you know, make or break films in the editing room. So, you know, if they, sometimes you leave something behind, it might absolutely be great. But in terms of the entire film, telling a story, no matter how good a particular scene is, you ultimately, the way it's supposed to work <laughs> yeah. is ultimately what's left there on the screen for the final picture is what tells the story best. 
And so you might get great performances cut, great scenes cut, because they don't fit in. On the other hand, sometimes they, you know, they'd love to have something in, but it so did not work. Tammy, there was something that Jill's ex-husband, Brad, said over this Oscar um, <laughs> period that he, he said, you know, we're storytellers. And I, it was a lovely, you know, he's his his um, his demeanor over the uh, the current uh, award season for Pitt has really portrayed him in a in a in a in a very charming light. One of the things that resonated with me is when he said it, he said, look. We're storytellers, and just at the end, when you do the math, some stories work and some don't, and you, you just, you know, you you chin up and you go on to the next one. And that's kind of, I think, what Jill is saying. You, uh, filmmakers like to think that, you know, uh, the choices they make influence whether the film is going to be outstanding or good or whatever, but at the end of it all, if it's not on the screen, if it's not in, in the edit, it's just, it's, it's not there. And there's, there's elements that, that are good, but you know, that's what makes films great. I mean, maybe even pretty woman to, it's certainly not because of me in any, in any significant part whatsoever, but you look at that film and that's the same age as phantom. And you look at pretty woman and you look at the themes. Okay, wait a minute. This is a, a Hollywood prostitute. And this is a wealthy businessman. Mm -hmm. And you see it, but within three minutes, you're disarmed because of the genuine charm that's on display between those characters. And it's magnetic and it just it it's it transcends any film, any footage or any edit. You, and it's just I guess Brad would say that's you do the math. That's one of those stories that works. So mm -hmm. everything's always there's always elements that conspire against it. You know, in this instance, maybe is it a horror film or is it a romantic tragedy or is it a bit of both? Um, you know, and it really comes down to is the magic captured? Is there something that's almost indefinable that's captured in that film? And, you know, great out of Africa, for instance, um, you know, yeah. there are films just stand out. Um, you know, once upon a time in Hollywood had a bit of it. Totally what? You. I, I just watched, rewatched that the other day and I was, I fell off my chair watching that film again. Out of uh, Africa? I just, I guess yeah. I, I was awestruck. Yeah. Even yeah. more so now. It was, it was one, I guess everybody was in the right place at the right time, I, I assume. We were lucky. And, you know, it was up, it was the courage and the moxie and uh, of the producer, Menachem Golan. And, you know, he's been gone several years and, you know, with, with with his passing and a couple other people like him gone is that fairly legitimate style of independent filmmaking, um, you know, which really demands a strong personality. I did a film a couple of years later that he actually directed in Georgia. It was a, a it was an abortion drama about a case in southern Georgia, and I played the uh, district attorney. Wow! And, you know, and I remember coming in, and he his cousin uh, Globus, I think he said, Alex, he was he was a phantom, he did very good. He said, would you do this film and all this bit? And then, you know, and he was directing. And Jill, you would you would, uh, you, it'd be hard pressed, but I, in many ways, with the exception maybe of Gary Marshall and Steven Spielberg, um, Menachem Golan was the best bloody director I ever worked with, only wow. because he he loved the actual process. Of, of playing in the sandbox. Oh. And he, he was such an infuriating producer to people uh, because of his sort of, you know, brash military style personality. But when he was inside the ropes directing, now he dire you, you knew not to, not to cross him. You could have questions, you could have actor discussion. Mm -hmm. He liked that. But if you pretended to pull a fuss, like I'll be in my trailer, you know, you, the trailer would be blowing up in half an hour. <laughs> you, know? you knew that, whether he was directing or producing. So you didn't do that. One, one of the actresses, I remember one of the actresses crossed him for a while, and that took about two days to unravel. But, uh, you know, so the power of actually making film, it's beautiful. And even if Menachem Golan could be a soft touch as a director, then it just tells you that the even the quest, it's like going fishing, even the quest for capturing magic is 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 self-fulfilling it's enough and it doesn't happen very often like pitt said this year you know sometimes it's just the math sometimes it adds up sometimes it doesn't and yeah I, I, that's definitely true and you take somebody like him but really i could be talking about anybody in his position who has the opportunity 
you, there's so much money in the mo- type of movies that somebody like him, an array of others like him are, are, you know, in and some bomb, some yeah. bomb, way worse yeah. than a little tiny movie made for a million dollars. Yeah, no, so absolutely. It, it does have to have that inherent, you know, James Mason in Stars Born with Judy Garland, you know, that yeah. magical quality you just can't put your finger on. Yeah, yeah. But, but speaking of Brad, I have to double down on what you said about him. I think in the award season, he he did come across like, that sweet, charming, you know, young, I, I just, I'm sorry to say it like this, but boy, yeah. <laughs> that he was. And, you know, I, I've always loved that. I, I believe this about people. You can take the country, take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. Yeah, and yeah. Really yeah, yeah. came across so, as he is. I mean, he came across as he actually is. Yeah. He's a lovely, sweet, fun, kind person. I was very happy to see that. I'm very, very, very happy for him to have won yeah. that award. Why don't, we, why don't we talk about Robert? Because I think a lot of people, you know, always go right to Freddy Krueger. That, that, that's who they picture him as. And that's all, you know, usually. And, and such a great role. And he's done so many different films as Freddy. But what was it like to work with him as opposed to, you know, seeing him on the big screen? Well, Jill probably worked with him a lot closer. But I mean, I, I, I hadn't really seen. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't really affected by the films. But, you know, he just seemed, you know, he seemed normal and happy to be there. I don't know. Jill probably has more insight into into his process. I didn't really, um, you know, I would never watch the Friday the 13th and those kind of films, the, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. I almost said Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, <laughs> I, I just was never that kind of a fan of those movies, but I did know him, obviously, who didn't. And I just, for me, I was, I didn't know what to think when I first went into it. I was happy to be a part of a Phantom movie, just as I said, historically. And for me, I was just pleasantly surprised. He was as lovely as could be. I just thought he was so generous, so open, not at all, um, I mean, he was such a great team player. Yeah. He got up so early in the morning, never once That's complained. True. Yeah. yeah. Never ever complained. Was right there, you know, on time, knew all his lines. I found him to be very generous. And, you know, I have a, my heart, I, you, you remember the original Grinch movie and, how his heart grows and grows and grows at the end of the movie. Mm. That's like mine. I mean, my heart's pretty big. But when I think of Robert, I am I have such fond personal feelings for um, Robert and his beautiful wife, Nancy. That's right. And yeah, just lovely, lovely people. And I just remember talking for hours and hours with them. And he was so knowledgeable about film and, I personally found him so generous as an actor. So over the years, I thought, wow, you know, the worst thing that ever happened to Robert England was Freddy Krueger. And wow, the best thing that ever happened to him was Freddy Krueger, because it is the gift for him. I would imagine that keeps giving, but like all things of that nature, you know, that has its very positive sides, but it, I'm sure, has really boxed him in as an actor. Now, that's me saying that. I certainly am, have no idea what's in his mind or what he thinks about it, and maybe he's talked about it publicly or not. Again, I have no idea. I'm just saying, for me, not so much as an actor even saying that, but my precedence when I think of him is more in friendship it's hard for me over the years I think of him so much as a friend who I met during um, a movie even though I'm not in 
very much contact with him at all. But, you know, every five years you run into each other. Yeah, I ran into him a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. No, you're well said. I mean, you know, the, it's not like it was a professional wrestler who's crossing over playing, you know, <laughs> Beauty and the Beast. He was a real actor and he was probably spent his years in theater and like, like, Ron, like Ron Perlman in Beauty and the Beast, you know, they in order to get if they're lucky enough, they get a break. It's usually heavy makeup and all that bit. Uh, but they're bloody good actors. And, um, yes. you know, Ron and Robert are two examples of that. Um, so like Jill says, it's a there's, it's a double edged sword. If it wasn't for Freddy Krueger, we wouldn't be talking about this version of Phantom of the Opera. Yes. You know, he's one yeah. of the few people on film forever. No one can take it away from him. He mm -hmm. got to play the Phantom in Phantom of the Opera in one of the few versions of the film that's been made. That's that's huge. No matter how, no matter how, you know whether it's no matter who made the film, I think it's huge. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Deep Thoughts with Jill Sherman. <laughs> you're absolutely right, my darling. What a wonderful way to phase out. Yeah, you're right. We don't really know that much about Robert because you know, funny enough. He was behind such a mask when we were working with him that he was a bit of an enigma. But you knew that, like she, like Jill says, that this was this was an actor who probably dreamed as a kid of playing parts like Phantom of the Opera much more than he did about playing in, the lead in slashers or whatever. But you know, he made those famous. And going back to the diff, the, what we're saying earlier about it's not easy to make some some of them add up and some of them don't. It's obvious the nightmare movies that that, that math added up. It redefined genres. And so it might have been simply due to Robert's charisma and Robert's acting ability to make it transcend a slasher movie. So, you know, we probably owe him a great deal. And um, in terms of, you know, what does where is Robert England in the pantheon of, you know, uh, late 20th century American movie actors in his genre. He's right up near the top. Uh, well, what, what is the final thing that you take away from Phantom? Before we close out our interview, what, do you, what is the mm. one thing that you kind of remember overall that will stick with you from doing this film? Oh, meeting my lovely interview co-star. Are you kidding? It was great. She and I were kind of, every you know, everybody else sort of came and went. And Robert, like Jill says, was, was in the makeup chair. <laughs> and I just remember those, those sort of, those friendships and those, lovely moment sort of discovering a new place and yeah and uh and robert's wife nancy and you know on days off we'd go for these long walks and uh you know the friendship it was uh it was a friendship without any salacious romance or without any gossip it was just you know it was a golden moment in a young i mean i'd only been doing it not even 10 years and that this was about 30 years ago and i'm still in the game so you, uh, I think it's one of those jobs you realize at the time that it's going to be a highlight. And 30 years later, when thanks to you, Tammy, we still get to talk about it. That's what I go back to, that it felt like a special time in, in, in the life of this young actor. And yes, I got to uh, portray a role that, that has, a, has a past and has, a, has, a, has an importance in, 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 in that genre. And so that was lovely. But it was just the... Um, the joy of discovery. Uh, and, uh, and I just remember, that's what I remember about that period. I, I'm going to piggyback on that first to say, I totally agree with everything that Alex just said. And he says it so eloquently and so beautifully. Um, and I think it was the whole environment, the whole setting was quite romantic not in yeah. a romantic way of uh how we think of romance like i love you and i'm falling in love not falling in love kind of romantic just romantic in its beauty there was just so much beauty there and it was a unique experience and it stays with you forever those yeah. kind of experiences yeah. they're they're like no one can take them away from you <laughs> You just hold them close within and they're they're just lovely private memories that's how i look and we were i remember really being trusted we were we were really left alone you know i mean it was <clears throat> it was a foreign location and they were filming every day and we didn't work every day we worked a lot yeah but but it's uh some sets when like you're if you're in some remote location there's a sort of like a survivor 
software aspect to it. You've seen the same people and, you know, uh, it can get, it can go another way. This one was, we felt trusted. We felt we left alone. If I remember, Menachem as a producer wasn't really around. They had an Irishman sort of looking after the thing. But it was a, it was, it was a very trusting and well-run production. You know, you never know. It was a lucky, I think it was a lucky time for us. Lucky to get the opportunity and lucky yeah. to still be talking about it in such, in such honest terms 30 years later. All these years later. Well, 30 years, should... which is pretty amazing. And I really want to thank both of you for being on the show. We've spoken for over an hour now, and I really ah, appreciate it. And thank I really you. hope they get to get the rest of the cast, you all, both of you and Robert together, hopefully for a physical 30 year reunion. Uh, Cause I still think it counts even now we're in 2020. Um, you know. It would be great to see all three of you together. I know Jill, you do some of the, the, uh, the scare cons, like when they do the horror cons. So oh, hopefully they good. can get you both together. I'll come to the Philly one whenever you're over here. <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank not, you both. Maybe, maybe maybe Robert and Brad should open a vegetarian restaurant in in Budapest, and we can all meet there. Yeah. <laughs> For you listeners who've just tuned in, please go back to the first fifteen minutes. <laughs> Sammy, thank you for taking the time and setting us up. It's great to uh, great to see you or hear you again, Jill. Yeah. Oh, Alex, you too. 